Hey there, it's Mike Bishop with Everyday Mission, and today I want to just do a teaching on baptism. We've been seeing a lot of people get baptized lately, which is amazing, um, but I think it's important to, and, and we certainly get this question a lot, um, what do we teach about baptism? What's important about baptism? And uh, obviously making sure that people who are getting baptized understand what they're getting into. So that's something just really important to me, and I hope this is helpful uh, for anyone listening. So in the New Testament, I think it's very clear that there's two types of baptism that we see in action. And both are important in the life of a Christian, but for very different reasons. And we'll get into those today. So the first is water baptism, or what is called the baptism of repentance. So in Matthew 3, 1 through 6, it says, In those days John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem and all over Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they had confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. So clearly in this passage, uh, the message was repentance. And as you probably know, repentance means just simply to turn away or to literally go in the opposite direction. Now, notice that it says, and when they confess their sins. This is at the end of that passage. There was confession, and confession always precedes repentance. It's the first step. It's saying, I'm wrong, I'm a sinner, my way doesn't work. And this is a real simple way to think about starting your journey as a follower of Jesus. And it's, it's asking the question, are you satisfied with living life on your own terms, your own way, and in your own strength? And if not, the first step towards God is just telling him basically that in your own words. Uh, my friend T. Freeman likes to say it this way, my way sucks, God's way is better. So baptism is physically acting out that prayer of confession and the repentance that follows. And I think it's important to say at this point that the Christian faith is not a nebulous, private thing that's just between you and whatever your idea of God is like. It's not so you can check a box and say, I'm spiritually okay. And it's not even just so you can go to heaven when you die. Uh, this is why we do baptism, this physical action with water. And it's why when we take the Lord's Supper, when we do communion, we do it with real bread and real wine, remembering the death and, and resurrection of Jesus. Your physical body, your life matters to God. And so baptism naturally uh, in that way is, is, a, is a physical act. And I know some segments of the church sprinkle and some, uh, you know, there's all kinds of different ways. Um, it's been our practice. We like to find a pool or the ocean or some body of water and baptize uh, in full uh, immersion, I guess is what people call it. But anyway, I just think it's important that it's some physical action with real water. Uh, this is not just a a, uh, a symbol with words, it's, it's action. And along those same lines, I think it's important to say that we have a story in the Bible that's a real story. Uh, that, that passage that I read in Matthew before, that really happened. People were going out in the wilderness. They knew they needed to be cleansed from their sin. They confess their sins, and John baptized them as a, as a baptism of repentance, of turning 
from their sins and turning to God. And so the, the, these stories that we read about in the Bible, these are real, real people, real events, and they lived just like we do and, and are now trying to follow God and trying to be his people in a way that's faithful. And so one of the stories that that actually is a mirror image of baptism is when God brought the Israelites out of Egypt to enter the promised land, and that was called the Exodus. So to escape Pharaoh, they had to cross the Red Sea. On one side, while they were in Egypt, they were in slavery and in bondage. On the other side, after God delivered them, brought them through the water, they were free to be God's people and worship him alone. So that's basically what we're experiencing in baptism. Following Jesus means your old life is dead and you're receiving a new life through him. And that's why the gospel literally means good news. That's amazing news. Remember, my way sucks. My way leads to death. My, la- my way leads to destruction. God's way is so much better and leads to life. So when you go down into the water, you come back up, it's like your own personal exodus. You're leaving a life of bondage to sin and your old way of doing things and receiving a new eternal life of love, freedom, and grace. The best news is that no one can take what God is giving you. No one can take it away. So when we say you'll have eternal life, when we tell someone or invite someone to follow Jesus uh, so that they can receive eternal life, this isn't just a, a promise of living forever. This is because you're receiving an eternal quality of life right now. This is, this is the life that God gives us from heaven. It's how God sees us. It's how we were always meant to be. That's, that's the life that God's giving us now. And yes, it does last forever, but sometimes Christians, I think, present the gospel and present eternal life in a way that, that is not rooted and connected to life now. And I think... <laughs> I always go back to if if you're someone that's aware of your sin and the weight of life, trying to live life on your own in your own strength, and you see the futility of that, whether it's addiction, whether it's uh, ruined relationships, whether it's depression, whether it's questions that you just can't answer anymore, the weight of, of just watching all of the, the poisonous stuff that we have to deal with in this world, uh, disease and war, all of that, when that comes down on your head and you realize, God, I can't do anything about this. I can't fix this anymore. You know, the answer is not just to die and escape heaven or, or, and go to heaven. The answer is to receive that heavenly life now and that heavenly, godly kingdom perspective now that we can actually live this life with God in the way he always intended it to be. Is it perfect here, this side of heaven? No, we're going to continue to fail. But when we enter into this relationship with Jesus, we enter into that life we enter, enter that, in, we enter into that life with others. That's called the church. And we have hope. We have hope that Jesus is coming back. He's going to set up his kingdom on earth, the perfect government of God. And we will be with him forever. So all of those things comprise what it means to, to really receive the good news. So the world preaches uh, a message that I think, uh, especially if you're of the younger generation right now, there's a message that is, is pretty clear that this is what the world says in response to all of that pain 
and suffering and questions. And that message is, is, is an acceptance. Just, just accept who you are. Accept your, your gender identity, your sexual orientation, your addictions, even your ties to demonic forces, all of those things. Just, just accept them. But that's not how God sees you. And when you come to him, he sees you as the person, not who's buried in those horrible things that might be things that, that either were done to you or that you believe about yourself. But he sees you as the person you'll be for eternity. He sees you as one who's been made whole, who's free from sin, a mature man or woman endowed with gifts and abilities he put in you for the purpose of bringing his peace into a broken world. So it's important to say at this point that baptism definitely is, an, is that introduction into that life, the, the laying down of the old, the bringing, uh, the invitation and, and God welcoming you into the new. Um, so not only do you get a new identity as a child of God, you get new brothers and sisters too. Baptism means you've been welcomed into the family of God. So there's this, this story in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 8, about the apostle Philip and this Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, now this guy was had been studying the scroll of Isaiah, which would have been incredibly expensive and, and hard to obtain. So he had access to wealth. He had access to, to things that maybe normal people didn't. But he was a seeker. And, and it said that it says that he had gone to Jerusalem to worship. So he, le he had left his comfortable life in Ethiopia. Um, you know, eunuchs, uh, part of the court of, of the, the king or the queen would have been, you know, highly favored people in their society. But he was a seeker. So he went, he went to Jerusalem to find out about this, this God, Yahweh. And Philip shares the gospel, he happens to, to come along and, and hear the eunuch uh, reading out of the scroll. And Philip comes up, shares the gospel of Jesus through the lens of the prophecies of Isaiah. And after hearing the gospel, listen to what he says. This is Acts 8, 36. As they rode along, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, the, the Bible doesn't really tell us how the eunuch uh, knew he was supposed to get baptized, that this was, <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't have the whole story. But I have a guess, and he was an outsider. He was a seeker, but even as someone who was able to go and worship with, with the means that he had, go all the way to Jerusalem, he was still on the outside looking in. Uh, he was not a Jew. And so I think this eunuch, though, because he had done his homework, so to say, and, and really had been seeking and learning about the story of the people of Israel and Israel's God, he would have known the story of the Exodus, and he would have known what it meant. And so I think on his way home, still seeking, God obviously supernaturally brings Philip to share the gospel and help him make sense of everything. But when the, the water comes along, he must have thought, here's my chance. Here's my only chance. I'm, I'm with someone who can help me become, finally become part of God's family. So likewise, if, if you've heard the good news of Jesus, if you've confessed your sins, if you've confessed him as your Lord and Savior and received this new life that God wants to give us now, this heavenly life, there's no reason to wait to be baptized. Be, be like the eunuch. Find the closest pool, pond, ocean, bathtub, horse trough. I've seen that many times. Uh, and find someone, find a, a, a body of believers that can come around you 
uh, pray for you, and, and baptize you. Water baptism is your public declaration to the world. And, and this is important, too, because Ephesians talks about that we don't fight against flesh and, and blood, but powers and principalities, rulers of this age. It's, it's the public declaration to those powers and principalities that used to dominate you, that used to control that message, that those lies that said, just accept who you are. This is the only way. This is just life. Get over it. But, but baptism is saying, no, there's actually something more real than what we see. And it's, it's Jesus's kingdom. It's his good government. It's what he wants to give us now and forever. And so baptism is saying, Jesus is king, and I want to follow him. I want to be his student. I want to be his disciple. Now, one of the practices we always like to do as a community, um, this, this is just over the years, something that we've we've kind of established I, I think is important and helpful is that a- after baptism we like to pray and lay hands on the person and ask God to break any ties to their old life whether it's sin a demonic power uh, even a family curse in some cases especially things that that have come down through the bloodline uh, which we know are, are very real and, and hold power over people. Now, sometimes those sins or addictions fall away immediately. Sometimes there's deliverance. Um, but often it will take time to learn how to live this new life without those old habits, without those family curses, without the false power that maybe we would have tapped into before Jesus. Uh, The Bible calls this sanctification, and it's a big part of what it means to actually follow Jesus. So very clearly, baptism doesn't save us. The action is not the moment of salvation. Uh, The moment of salvation is, is very clearly in Scripture just coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, you're the King, you're the Lord, and I submit to you. And, and that act of submission, that act of, of, of confession, is what really opens the door for God to give you that new life. But baptism is being obedient to a command of Jesus. Um, this, is, this is an act of obedience. It's, again, a physical representation, a physical reality to what is true in our heart and our mind and our will. And so I think it's important to say that it is an act of obedience solely to Jesus. This is not something that um, you're doing to obey your pastor or another leader. Uh, It's not something that you're doing to obey the rules or laws of a church uh, or for entry into a church body. This is about you and Jesus and your obedience to him and desire to be his disciple. And that's, I think it's important to say also, that's how discipleship works. When we talk about being a disciple and discipling others, you aren't my disciple. You're not, you're not Mike's disciple. If I'm, if I'm leading you in the process of discipleship, you're a disciple of Jesus. And, and my job is to help you fall more in love with Jesus and want to serve him want, more, want to obey his commands, want to uh, really freely uh, live a life of, of love and, and really be living into that eternal quality of life that I was talking about before. So those are the prayers that we, we pray. We lay hands on a person. Um, and, and we've seen some incredible uh, freedom and incredible results even very quickly in someone's life when, when they come to the decision to be baptized. So in addition to breaking off those ties and, and those prayers, we also 
practice and and want to do this and 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 do it all the time right after baptism but can be done in other times as well that the person is filled with the holy spirit so i want to go back to um matthew 3 and this is a little bit later in the passage uh talking about john the baptist uh, this is matthew 3 verse 11 I baptize you with water for repentance. This is John speaking. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So in charismatic circles and uh, many parts of the church, this baptism is often called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I, in studying, realized um, and maybe... I'm unique. I don't think I am, but I really think it should be called the baptism of Jesus. And I have some reasons why. So what does he give us in this baptism? What are we given? We're given the spirit, right? We're given the Holy Spirit. And in Acts uh, chapter 19, there's an example of this. Um, It says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience? He asked. And they replied, the baptism of Paul. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. They were about 12 men. There were about 12 men in all. So what's the first thing you notice in, in this passage about this specific baptism that happened to these 12 guys. Well, first, it's it's that there's no water, right? So that action, um, that baptism of repentance, they already had done that. They already had been water baptized for repentance of sin. But notice that it, it says that as soon as they heard this, and, and what did, did Paul say? Paul said, believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. And it it says, as soon as they heard this, they were baptized. So this baptism is not a baptism of of water, of of physical uh, reality, like I was talking about before with water baptism. This is a baptism of power. It's a baptism of word, specifically the name of Jesus, and of the laying on of hands to receive the Holy Spirit. So this is why I like calling this the baptism of Jesus, or or you can call it spirit baptism, or if you want, call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to get too hung up on that. But it's what John said he would do and what Jesus himself promised. So in Acts 1.5, the promise is, For John baptized with water, and this is, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So that answers the question. What does this baptism do? Jesus, this this baptism of Jesus, spirit baptism, baptism of the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it, it is receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. The first disciples had Jesus with them 24 hours a day, and they did fantastic things. But if they were going to start a movement to change the world, they needed power. And specifically, they needed God's power through his spirit. So the second question, so if that's what the baptism of the spirit does, what is it for? Let's go back to Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the baptism of Jesus, or spirit baptism, it's about mission. It's the power we need to go out and do the works of Jesus. You can be a disciple without it. 
and there's plenty of people that are, uh, but you'll lack power. And, and I think we've seen this over the years. We've seen this with people that have come to faith or maybe their story is they came to faith as a, as a young person. Um, and you know, for whatever reason, life happens and their experience of walking with God is just really, really hard. Uh, like I said before, this process of, of following Jesus, sanctification, living out the reality that God is giving us this eternal quality of life. It's not a picnic. <laughs> this is hard. Life, life in the spirit is hard. Uh, every day is is an act of receiving God's grace um, for that day, right? And Jesus talks about that. He talks about receiving your daily bread. So to fulfill your calling and purpose that God has for you as His disciple, you need to be filled with God's Spirit. Now, like I said. We like to practice this um, and lay hands on on people immediately after they are water baptized. But this is something also that can happen uh, maybe years later after coming to faith. I know for me, I was a very young person when I came to faith in Jesus. Uh, it was probably 10 years later when a youth pastor laid hands on me and and I received the, the baptism of the Spirit at that point. Um, now, obviously, one big part uh, in the book of Acts that you see over and over again, and it, it mentions it in that passage in Acts 19, and obviously uh, during Pentecost, is receiving uh, the gift of tongues and, and also prophesying. And these are gifts of the Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit, We'll read 1 Corinthians, and if you want to dig into that a little bit more, and that's a teaching for another time, but um, very clearly the uh, the sign, or or many people say the evidence of the uh, the baptism of the Spirit is receiving that, that prayer language, um, uh, not just a prayer language, but also the ability to prophesy in other tongues, um, which, you know, I know for some segments of the church, it's like, oh, wow, that's, that's strange or foreign, or that's what the crazy charismatics do. But um, very clearly in Scripture, this is, this is pretty normal. It's normal Christian life. And, and I think I would encourage you, if, if it is something that's a little strange, to um, follow up with, with some folks that you know that, that do speak in tongues and do prophesy. And we can certainly help walk you through any questions you have with that. But here's a common question. Does everyone speak in tongues immediately after being baptized in the Spirit? And I think the answer is no. Now, I know a lot of people would say, well, what about this story from Acts? What about that story from Acts? I think it's pretty clear in Scripture, and it's been our experience, that when we lay hands on someone to receive the baptism of the Spirit, we do it in faith. And when someone receives it, they also do it in faith. And in that exchange of, of believing that God is going to do what the Scripture says, we really leave that up to him at that point. Whatever the Holy Spirit, however the Holy Spirit wants to work with that individual. So is it common that people receive tongues? Yes. Uh, it happened to me. Um, I think... Many people have that experience. However, is it mandatory? I think the scripture says that it can happen uh, immediately. It can happen later. Uh, there's plenty of stories that bear that out. Uh, we're not going to try to force anyone to speak in tongues. We're not going to try to do anything to make you feel like you're less of a uh, you know, disciple of Jesus just because maybe that's something that uh, comes later. I know for for Amber, her story was um, people laid hands on her uh, when she was in college uh, to receive the Holy Spirit, and she did not speak in tongues right away. It was she had a, a definite experience with the Holy Spirit, was filled with power. Um, she even saw 
angels and demonic forces um, and just had crazy experiences with the Lord, but did not speak in tongues for, I think, uh, many months later. Uh, it, was a, it was a process of, of just walking with God with that gift. So, and I, and I think if you go back, go back and read the various stories in the book of Acts, you'll see a lot of different um, experiences. So there, there will be occasions like this passage from Acts 19 where someone's like, I haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. <laughs> I really understood how to receive his power and what that looks like. Um, and then there's other stories and uh, our friend Giovanni, this was his experience, where in coming to faith, the Holy Spirit was poured out on his life even before he had been baptized. And even before he had really, you know, fully submitted his life to Jesus, he had a, a, an amazing encounter with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. So I, I, I think it's important to not get uh, uh, too far into various boxes that we say, this is how it has to look every time. Um, I think the important thing to say is we go back to, to summarizing the purpose of this teaching today. Uh, if you've committed your life to Jesus, if you're his disciple, there's nothing to keep you from getting baptized in water. Uh, have that experience with Jesus, um, and, and submit to that command and that invitation, uh, and also have that experience with the body of Christ and understand that, that now you are part of God's family. And you have brothers and sisters and moms and dads and aunts and uncles that you can count on and rely on and, and journey with uh, the rest of your life. You, Jesus, in fact, said that, that this family will be closer than even your blood family uh, because it's an e eternal family. Also, given the fact that all of you have been called to God's mission, go read Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in my name. And, and because that command is there and it's it's for all followers of Jesus. There is nothing and no reason why anyone should be kept from getting baptized in the name of Jesus and receiving the Holy Spirit in fullness. And that comes through, again, that's not, that's not water, that's word. That's word and power through the laying on of hands. So just, just to finish here, a little equation, if you will. <laughs> Water baptism equals repentance, and it leads to becoming a disciple of Jesus. Spirit baptism equals power, and it leads to following the mission of Jesus as he has prescribed for you and called you. And that's the beautiful thing about mission. That's the whole reason why Again, we have called this, uh, this movement, this network, Everyday Mission, because all of us are called to be his everyday missionaries in, in a variety of ways, uh, kaleidoscope, if you will, of ways that, um, that really represent and I think reflect the beauty and the diversity of God's kingdom. That's, that's who he's called us to be. So... Hope this is helpful. If you have any questions, reach out to us. Uh, go to our website, everydaymission.com. Uh, again, this is Mike Bishop. If you want to reach out to me directly, my email is everydaymission at gmail.com. And I will uh, look forward to hearing from you.